It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. This episode of the Up North Journal podcast is brought to you by PSE Archery, Black Eagle Arrows, Killer Food Plots, Cabela's, Spot Shooters, Antler Action, Family Traditions Tree Stands, Tom's Custom Turkey Calls, and Badass Slingshots. Welcome back to another episode of the Up North Journal. I'm your host, everybody, Mike Adams, sitting in the, the mobile cabin with Dan DeFaw. You're in the driver's seat. <laughs> I am in the driver's seat. I better pay attention, man. We're on the road. Literally. Yes, literally on the road. We're on our way back. From an event that we, uh, we've we been talking about here for the last couple of weeks. Absolutely. And did we have fun or what today? I had a blast. It was... Uh, it, I don't know, man. When, when you go into something blind and you don't know what to expect, you, you get kind of apprehensive, you get kind of anxious, and that's what today was. You know what? I'm not going to lie. I was very nervous. Were you? Oh, you yeah. know what? Look, like we were talking about, I was expecting a lot more people. That's true. That's I true. was expecting, uh, I don't know, uh, more than, I don't know, there might have been three dozen people here. Yeah, three, four dozen at the most, yeah. At the most, I was expecting like a line of a hundred, you know, you know, a hundred and yeah. waiting in line and or whatnot. And yeah, I was I was a little nervous about what we were going to be shooting against. Uh, and then the, the the even better, unknown distances. Right. Yeah, we up went to, to up to fifty meters or like fifty five yards. Right. And we like we we talk about we we deal in yards. Yeah. Yeah. And they're. We're going to shoot something that's dealing with in meters. Yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk about that. We actually got a pretty decent explanation on that from uh, Skip. Mo- Skip, the manager of uh, Mud Mudjaw Archery. That's or, where Mudjaw we were. Mudjaw Bowman. That's where we were at shooting today. Yeah. And so. as I get on the freeway here, I see traffic backed up here for a good distance. I don't know what's going on, but I'm glad we're not on that side. Yes, sir. So, but uh, yeah, we went down and shot today. It was uh, Dan Yasa the. Uh, PSC sales manager for Ohio, Michigan, invited us down and gave us a call and said, "Hey, uh, you guys want to shoot a feed a field tournament?" And I'm like, uh, "Who a what a tournament?" Yeah, well, <laughs> a feed a what? But um, yeah, it, he gave us a call and you know you want to shoot it and we're like, "Okay, yeah, we'll give it a whirl." We've never shot it before, never shot a tournament before, but we'll give it a whirl, right? Yeah, and then he, then he said, "Yeah, and unknown distances." Yeah, the first day because it's actually a two-day tournament. Yeah. Uh, where they have, um, how many targets was it? Twelve targets. Yeah, twelve target. Twenty-four per day. Twenty-four per day. What you do is you shoot a round of twelve. They take a break for lunch, and then you shoot another round of twelve, and you shoot three arrows at each target. So, we went out for the first round of twelve at unknown distances. So that's the first day. That's your first day is unknown distances. Uh, two rounds of 12, you know, let the arrows fly. Yeah. Absolutely. And tomorrow, they're going to come back and... Oh, and by the way, those distances, uh, it depends on the size of the target. Yeah, the face of the target. The face of the target is a diameter. Yeah. And that diameter will tell you if it's between, like, 25 and 35 and 35 to 45 and 45 and higher. Yeah. The distance, but they won't tell you on the first day. Second day, you come back, and it's the same face targets, uh, basically a bullseye, but they tell you now what distance you can shoot. Yeah, it's a known distance for the target. But you're only allowed basically one pin. Yeah, you know, it, it, you know, as we explain next time when we're talking with, uh, with Dan Yasa and Skip, uh, from the archery club there you know they they only allow one pin on here but they they did allow danny and i to come in uh just kind of come in as um and to enjoy the event and shoot uh we get, yeah we, we did use all of our pins we did use all of our pins uh it gave us exposure to, to what fida is and, and come down and enjoy the day and what a beautiful day it has been it's been yeah it's awesome man the nice little breeze sunny skies uh, the bugs weren't bad. You know, we were in woods that actually were flooded, he said, uh, le- less than a month ago, I Yeah, believe. three weeks ago. And they were shooting fish in the woods. They, there's a, a raised platform in the woods, and they said it flooded. 
that they were on top of that raised platform shooting carp. Shooting carp. <laughs> Is that hilarious or what? Uh, Just yeah. three weeks ago. So yeah, it's in. It, I guess it's in a floodplain, right there by the river. Yeah, a little bit, huh? <laughs> so yeah, three weeks ago shooting carp. Three weeks later shooting a tournament here in in, in, in Greater Toledo uh, area, but. Uh, what a beautiful day it was for that. Uh, like Mike said, it was a little bit of a breeze. No bugs. That was the thing, you know, especially them talking about it being flooded down in the woods, you know, in, in shaded areas. You would expect, there, there was a few mosquitoes buzzing, but it was nowhere near bad. Oh, it, it, yeah, it could have been a lot worse. So, you know, and, and the humidity is really down for July. Absolutely. So it made it even better. But like you said, we, you know, Mike and I are down here. Well, we're on our way back now. But what an interesting shoot. It was great shoot. What I liked really uh, liked about it was seeing the age groups. There was, yeah. we figured the youngest, she might have been about eight. And Maybe, the, yeah. Yeah, and the oldest guy, I would almost say he was pretty close to 70. Yeah. You know, so it was good to see. A big, wide range of people. Wide range of, of, of people shooting this tournament. So, what a blast. Yeah, looking at it. At other things that you shot, if you shot any, like you shot 3D tournaments and stuff. Yeah, we shot we shot yeah. some 3D foam. We went to Reinhardt and. What What was the biggest thing that you took away from this versus a, like a 3D tournament that you'd shot? I mean, the biggest difference, or maybe something that you really learned uh, while you were out geez, there shooting. Oh, beads. Okay, so today, uh, what I learned was uh, I stink. <laughs> no, you don't stink. You just you're just having some issues with something. That's yeah, all. Yeah, I was man. I the first round of twelve, I was just. I think I was nervous. I was just downright ick. The second I improved my score, and it was like, okay, it felt a little better. And then after, then Dan gives me the pointers right. to help me. Thanks. But he said, <laughs> but it was just one of those things that, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was fun. And I liked, I kind of liked it not having that many people. We never really got backed up. No. Like when we shot that Reinhardt. Uh, we we stand got stand and wait. We stayed. We you know we shot. Then we went to the next one. We stood and wait. We stood and wait. We did more waiting, and it got longer. And you know, and but this one it, it flowed really well. They had everybody go to a, a a target, and then start shooting. Yeah, they had the 12, 12 targets. You know, and that, that I really think that's why there was only three people per group instead of four. Because uh, normally in that competition, there's four people per group that shoot. Right. The way it's set up. But, you know, most of the groups were three. There was one. The one ahead of us had four. Yep. So, you know, so. They, they had enough people to fill out uh, the whole field of, of all the targets. Right. Exactly. So, you know, but uh, other than that, uh, judging those distances, that was kind of interesting. And we started off on number 10. And wouldn't you know. The longest target on, well, second longest target on the range. Right. And uh, my, my biggest concern, being nervous, losing was losing an arrow. arrow. Yeah, exactly. And it was like, oh, really? So, uh, but we didn't lose. We, <laughs> Mike and I did not lose an arrow in shooting the tournament itself. We lost our arrows while shooting practice. I lost one arrow in practice. We yeah. lo- me and him both lost an arrow on the same target shooting the 60 meter target yeah which they said was 66 yards right and we were way short yeah yeah i uh i used my 50 yard pin because that's what i had my my floater pin sighted in at uh i haven't set any other distances yet uh on my tape on my site so i held it high and let her fly yeah and that was it and both of ours were, and were I short to die <laughs> <laughs> we, we were both short and they went right into the grass perfectly, and yeah, right they lost. the target. Yeah, yep. so they're buried in the grass. Hopefully, yeah. somebody will get them a couple of nice black eagle arrows. Right, exactly. Because you were shooting the renegades, right? Or what, what yeah, you... no, I was shooting the zombies. Oh, you were shooting the zombies. I was yep. shooting the renegades. Uh, matter of fact, that's an interesting take. We talked to Dan Yasa about too about the smaller diameter arrows because he was using toothpicks, toothpicks <laughs> with with a, a, toothpicks with a knock. And some veins and a point, basically. It was a, a real tiny, tiny diameter arrow. But talking about the, you know, the weight of the arrow versus, it, you know, the trajectory that they were, he was shooting um, and carrying the speed downrange uh, and the wind and the drag and all that. I mean, it, 
it, it's amazing how much science can go into well getting a stick downrange off a string. Besides that, you had the people that were shooting recurves, and then you had you know the people shooting compounds. Right. You know right. that was a big difference too. And and Dan gave us one goal. He goes, don't let the people with recurves show you up. <laughs> you know, and uh, and I'm sure they plenty did. But yeah, that was one of the things that. Uh, you know, as we that was one of the nice things too that we got to do is we got to shoot in a group with Dan, mm-hmm. and uh, we kind of walked and talked and and, and learned a lot of things yep. that you know, it, it, you know, basically like we do here in the cabin, have a fireside chat while walking, learning, talking archery, right? Yeah, you know, uh, we we try to pass along our knowledge and things that we've done or things we've seen or experienced, you know, and and that's what it was today with Dan doing to, for us. Oh, absolutely. I mean. Uh, he had some pointers for me after the done done shooting. He wants me to work on some stuff because uh, I have some issues. <laughs> I could have told him you had issues. Uh, true, good point. <laughs> but oh, uh, you mean archery? Issues. Yeah, archery issues. <laughs> okay. Stop it. So, but uh, yeah, it was a, a blast. I, I think it, overall, um, it was it was it was fun, and I, and I I'd be glad to do it again next year. Yeah, absolutely. Well. I tell you what, we're uh, we're gonna bump up here on a break because we're pulling into one of everybody's favorite stores, Cabela's. Here. Absolutely, we got to pull into Cabela's because somebody. I got to return something. Yeah, and so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna um, go to our first break, and uh, as we come into our second break, we're gonna do an interview with Skip, who is on the board of Mudjaw Mudjaw. Bowman. And his and we're going to talk. And Dan Yas is going to be there with us. Uh, an interview we did with him just a few minutes ago at the show, uh, at at not at the show at the uh, Sportsman's Club there. And he's going to tell you all about Mud Jaw and Fida. We'll be right back after this. PSC Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now the most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Killer Food Plots have been helping property owners for over 20 years create premier whitetail habitat. Whether replenishing your soil with their all-natural organic fusion pellets or planting a premier KFP food plot seed blend to help your deer rebuild their bodies through spring and summer while supplying the much-needed high energy during and after the rut, you can trust that Killer Food Plots family and their products will help your deer achieve their full potential. Welcome back to the second segment of the show. We are down in the greater Toledo area. Yes, we are. We're down here at Mudjaw Bowman. And uh, as we got ready to say before we were through to the break, we're going to have an interview here. We, we've got uh, one of the board members here at Mudjaw. He's in charge of the, the field operations here. Skip Smajinski. Uh, Skip, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, this is the first time I've ever shot an event like this. I've always shot 3D foam. You know, it's uh, this is a whole different ball game. Um, this is a beautiful course you got out here. Talk a little bit about about the event that we shot today and kind of how this works. Okay, um, today was the um, Ohio State Feet of Field. Um, it's a um, two-day shoot. The first day, like you guys shot today, was all unmarked distances. You shoot 24 targets, ranging anywhere for the adults is anywhere from uh, 10 meters out to 55 meters. Um, you shoot three arrows per target um, at a black and yellow face. Um, and then tomorrow you'll shoot um, same face, but uh, at mark distances from 10 meters to, to 60 meters. You know, we really appreciate you letting us hunters come in here and, and, and Absolutely. Tr- try our hand at this. What really got me is you guys, you guys are talking 10, 15, 20 meters, whatever. I, I'm, I'm used to yardage. Yeah, we're, we're, we're you know, yards kind of people. And, you know, and Dan Yaz, he's, he started talking about meters and centimeters on the faces, and I'm like, Huh? <laughs> but, exactly. But we appreciate you letting us come in, uh, you know, as, you know, kind of uh, come in and shoot. Uh, I mean, we shot for score, but we're not in we're, the we're tournament. We're not in it. But, uh, yeah, you know, 
that's that's a big switch over from yardage to, to meters when you're not used to that. Uh, do you have a lot of hunters come in here and shoot these events, or are these mostly just target archers? Um, this event's mostly target archers, um, and even myself, I don't do the meter thing either. So, okay. so I'm right there with you. I'm the whole time calculating. Okay, this is 50 meters, which is you know add roughly 10 percent, roughly 55 yards. You know, so I'm I'm right there with you. It's it's different. You know, I judge everything in yards, and then I have to, so and luckily my sight tapes in yards. So I'll go go that route. He's the old converter guy where Dan was over there. Yeah. I Dan, Dan, get over here. Come on, man. Your brain was smoking out there. I've seen you doing all these calculations in your head, but uh, talk a little bit about having to run through something like that. Between and, you two guys, because you yeah. stay with the yards, convert to yards. You stay. You don't convert to a yards, right? No, I don't convert to yards. I, for me, like tomorrow on the mark side, I'm going to walk up to the stake, and it's going to say 40. I want to crank my sight to 40. I don't want to have to go. 40 is 40 times and get to 44 yards and have a chance to miss at my site so typically on my site program i'll just switch over to meters and get my marks and and make a site tape for meters now, now tomorrow i will have a meter uh print out for my marks so i want to do the conversion but today i forgot about doing it and i judge oh so you anyway. did forget so, uh -ha. So, today, so, so today i do you know i judge in yardage anyway so there wasn't any sense in having but i was converting and you know i can okay the 40 centimeters between um 20 and 30 meters or whatever it was and then, so i had to convert that to yards and say okay that's between 22 and 30 three yards or whatever then i could you know to make sure i was in the right ballpark but but yeah it's uh um definitely different if you're not used to doing the metric stuff oh it melted my brain especially uh i was lost you know he started talking centimeters on the faces of the targets you know you've got i think is it 24 40 60 and 80 is that right 20 40 60 20 40 60 okay and there's one out there and it you couldn't tell if it was a 60 or 80 because it was on a different size bale, you know, a smaller bale, bigger. It looked like a bigger target, and then playing with the distances in the tunnel with the lighting, yep. and yeah, it, it that kind of threw me for a loop. I think we were all we were all taken back on that that one now after yeah. we let our arrows go. Yeah, I think the one with the the big bale with the big target on it got a lot of people. A lot of people misspaced that one. Um, now, like this isn't even that. This is pretty soft when it comes to a feet of field. I mean, your typical feet of field. You know, you had this tree stand shot. It was a 15, 15 feet up, pretty good short you yeah, know, angle yeah, at the short it was. distance. That's nothing. I mean, you can have shots. You know, that are 50 meters like that, or you might have an uphill shot like that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the terrain here to get uphill shots like that safely. Right. Um, but uh, so we do things like that. Play with the tunnel effects, things like that. To, you know, throw you off a little bit. Can't make it too easy. It, it did. It, it played with my, my head a little bit, you know, and the last couple of weeks I've been shooting different distances and, and trying to really hone in on, on estimating distance. But yeah, this, this warped my head. <laughs> it for, was good. Fortunately for me, I used to shoot. A, I used to shoot a lot of 3D. You know, it's been quite a few years, but so I, you know, I'm, I'm used to judging the yardage, and so it uh, wasn't too bad. But the, it uh, is definitely you know a shot with a couple target guys. It's like yeah, they, they hate this unmarked part because it's just a guess. You know, right. Time. I mean, they look at that sheet and say, okay, this can be between 20 and 35 meters. Is it closer to 20 or closer to 35? And they say, yep. Yeah. Uh, pick one of those numbers and that's good. To go. Right on. It, it's something else here that, that Dan keyed us in on is uh, shooting the feet of field. You're only allowed one pen on on your uh, your uh, sight. You you're not uh, you don't have multiple pens where you can shoot. Uh, I think you think te technically you only have one reference point in your scope, I believe. One, okay. So one, and you're five, on one pen. Five pins would be technically no, five, no. five reference points. Yeah. So. so that's a little different, you know, for us guys. I mean, you know, we're used to you think? setting up on 20, 30, 40, and I got a floater. Uh, like I said, and I appreciate you letting us come in here and play today because that's really all we did. We, we got to play. Yep, it's, it's good to uh, expose people to things like that. As you can see what, you know, the target side of things are. And, and it makes you, you know, better for hunting too. You know, I mean, it's... Good practice. Speaking of exposing, tell us about the mud job Bowman here. Give us a little background of, of this place and where where it is and how it is and how old it is. Yep, uh, the club's been around since 1953. Um, we've mo they've moved around a little. I've only been here since about 09, so you know about eight years or so. Um, the uh, um, they've had a few different locations. They've been here on this property since about 1970, I believe. Um, it's one of the oldest clubs around. Um, not a huge membership. I think we're right around 50 paying members and like about 20 lifetime members after after you're a member for I believe it's 15 years you become a life you know a life member and you don't have to pay dues anymore um, we got a lot of old guys that go back a long ways um, uh, Fred Bear actually used to come down here and shoot some back in the 50s like the one uh, probably one the oldest surviving member the, might be the only surviving member one of the original founders he used to actually hunt with Fred Bear no no kidding he's 90. I think John, his name's John Sinkovich. I believe he's 92. That's right awesome. Um, what a legacy. Yes. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, we got about 30 acres here. Um, um, we do um, 
I run some field leagues here. We do uh, um, a lot of uh, indoor stuff. Got a big uh, indoor league on Wednesday nights, um, which, is, which is all pretty much hunters. Um, okay. They shoot animal targets indoors from anywhere from 20 feet to 60 feet, you know, 20 yards. Um, okay. Um, uh, this area in general has a ton of uh, hunting hunters and traditional guys. Recurves are big in this area. Okay. Um, they do a lot. We do 3D shoots, um, and we also do paper animal shoots, cardboard animals. They that's really big in this area. They like the they cardboard cutouts, draw kills and stuff on them, and put them up. There you go. The traditional guys really like that. Um, myself, I'd rather shoot the 3D targets, but you know, <laughs> right. But that's what they like doing. And, right. Uh, that's what's really big in this area. Um, you know, we. Um, um, every year we do a big wild game dinner. That's our main fundraiser for the year. Every um, February, we usually pack the place with about uh, oh about 300 plus people. Nice. Um, but uh, yeah, we think we got 22 indoor lanes in there, um, and we do run on Monday nights. We run a family night, so families come out. Kids start off as a kids night, then the parents got involved, so we just made it family night. So kids, parents come out and shoot. Um, we do, do run it during the winter, but on Fridays we run like a Joe Ed program for the kids that want to take it a little more serious, get into more of the target stuff. Okay. And then Tuesday nights we would run a, a spot with members. Okay. But. So uh, you got room for memberships? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What does membership here cost if somebody's interested? Um, the first year is $125. It's a $50 initiation fee, and then it's um, $75 a year after. Okay. And then after a year, a, uh, a member for two years, you can apply to be what we call a certificate holder. Um, you pay $250, and then you get a key for the indoor range and get 24 hours. Practice. Okay. So, now, and uh, if somebody wanted to join the league, uh, how would they get a hold of you? Um, you can go to mudjawbowman.com and uh, send an email, and there, there's a phone number on there too. You can call, leave okay. a message, and I think the I think the phone actually comes here to the clubhouse, so it doesn't. <laughs> so my probably won't answer, but you can leave a message and get gotcha. back to you. Um, but yeah, the leagues, like the w indoor leagues, start um, usually first week of January. Okay. And uh, Sarah, Wednesday there's a big one. There's usually. Uh, uh, 40 plus people and they're shooting and they they shoot a half and make dinner and then eat dinner and then shoot second half there you go that was, see that's the thing you guys had lunch here for us and we shot the first half and after that i want to take a nap yep. <laughs> i got a little you sluggish did. yeah i got a little sluggish out on the course there so but no that was that was nice and everything um and, and something else that's very unique about this place i've never actually shot anything where i've i've crossed state line multiple times throughout the day yeah yeah, that's one thing unique. We got an Ohio mailing address, but the majority of the property is in Michigan. Yeah, so you're right on the state line. Yep. Okay. Yep. So anybody of our listeners that are in the greater our Toledo or greater Toledo area that want to join a sportsman archery sportsman's club, they can yeah. come out to Mudja. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and uh, before before we go here to break, uh, Dan, uh, you mentioned that uh, we've got a PSE dealer here right here in the area that where people can get their bows worked on, and you want to talk about. Uh, I forget the name of the place, but I know you remember it. <laughs> Cleland's Outdoor World is the, our, our PSC dealer in the greater Toledo area. Uh, Galen kind of runs the show on the archery side over there, and they do quite a bit of stuff with uh, targets and kids and um, have an indoor range. So if you guys are in the market for a PSC or wanting to shoot some of the new stuff, go over, head over to Cleland's and talk to Galen. All right. So uh, what do you think, Dan? You ready to should we talk about this a little more on our way home here? Absolutely. All right. We're going to throw it to a break here. And next time you hear from us coming out of the break, we're going to be on our way back to Michigan. Actually, Michigan, I think, is just across the parking lot here. Actually, so. you're standing in Michigan right now. Oh, I'm standing in Michigan. Okay. We got to go. We, we got to go to Ohio to get back to Michigan. Yep. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for us. We'll be right back after this break. So what do you do when you've completely redefined the way bows are engineered? When you've reached the pinnacle and the band starts playing your victory song, you start a revolution out of thin air. Introducing the all-new PSE Carbon Air. Engineered with true carbon technology to be the lightest high-performance bow in the world. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Killer Food Plots have been helping property owners for over 20 years create premier whitetail habitat. Whether replenishing your soil with their all-natural organic fusion pellets or planting a premier KFP food plot seed blend to help your deer rebuild their bodies through spring and summer while supplying the much needed high energy during and after the rut, you can trust that Killer Food Plots family and their products will help your deer achieve their full potential. Welcome, everybody. Third segment of the show. 
You just heard a, a great interview from uh, Skip at Mudjaw with Dan Yasa and Mike and I. And uh, I could only say his name correctly once, so that's that's I have, I'm sticking with that. Yeah, <laughs> go with it, because it it ends in ski. Yep. And uh, we weren't going to play that game. I practiced it. You did, but uh, we're back, getting back out on the road from uh, everybody's favorite. Um, Sporting goods store. And here comes a cor- brand new Corvette in- into Cabela's. May I ask how how one would hunt or fish with a Corvette? Well, I tell, you, I tell you what. It would be fun. But I'd like to see somebody strap a deer to the back of that. I would, too. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> that would be funny. But uh, and, and here's a bonus for everybody that's listening. Uh, it's been a few hours now since we, we, we went to Toledo and we went and shot in this and we get back in, and Mike's in the driver's seat, and we're going down the road, and, and guess, lo and behold, he still got hot coffee in his thermos. I do. Yep. Got my little mossy oak. Uh, Not little. Well, tumbler here. It's a 32 it, ounce it, it, tumbler. It's one of those metal tumblers like some of the other companies make. And actually, I don't even know who make who makes that one, but it's got mossy oak on it. So. Right, exactly. It's so, camouflage. And, but he went and took a taste of the coffee, and the coffee was still warm. Yep. Not that the vehicle was still warm itself to keep it warm. But yeah, that might have had something to do with it. A little bit. But, yeah, so third segment of the show. All right. Looking back at the overall at the shoe, you, you improved from the first segment to the second segment. You got some tutelage. Okay, so the first, the first 12 targets, I had four misses. Okay. The second round, I had zero misses. That's good. That's good. Uh, and I improved my score by five points the second yeah, over the first. Yeah, yeah. So to me, that was a win-win. Win, yep. Improvement's always good. Absolutely. And then I got some toolage on the last one with Dan, and he wants me to work on some stuff because he was seeing some stuff that I was doing that was kind of... And he thinks that's coming from that new release you're using. Right, exactly. And, and tell you the truth, I've nobody's ever watched me shoot. Right. Because I'm always shooting in the backyard by myself. And I couldn't watch you shoot today. Right, because you and I were on the line together at the same time. Yep. But uh, so he said, hey, I got some tips for you. So uh, I had no problem taking a little bit of tutelage from Dan Yasa. Uh, it gave me something to work on, uh, my sight and my trigger. So with that being said, I will be practicing tomorrow promptly to get that in fresh in my mind what he told me to do and start doing it. Yeah, we ought to have a we ought to shoot tomorrow. Get up in the morning and uh, put a few arrows down range. I'm sleeping in tomorrow, dude. Sleep it sleeping in for you is six o'clock though. Yeah, I know. For you it was a little early for you. It was early this morning. I got up at five thirty. I know. It was uh but, So so what was your takeaway from your shoot? I, I was I liked what I did because I improved from the first. Mm-hmm. I think I was a bundle of nerves the first twelve because it was just total. I don't know. It was mental chaos. Sure. Well, you know, the whole point of me coming down here, or actually the last two weeks, I've been shooting the the evolve, getting it set up for this shoot, making sure that I was ready to go. You know, the last two weeks I've been pounding arrows into the target, and uh, you know, and I was pretty happy with the way I was shooting. At you, home. you you had. You actually, on the second round, you started off neck and neck with Dan. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Yeah, you did. You were going. <laughs> and then I at fell it. apart. <laughs> the first, the first three targets out of twelve. Yeah. I think you were up on Dan. I or don't know pretty about close. That. I, I don't think. Hold I'll... on, let me look. Oh, you know what? I don't have we his. We don't score. have Dan's scorecard. No, we don't. In. Yeah, we, we turned his we, in. Just because they let us come down and shoot with our hunting gear, um, you know, with the, the extra pens on there, they. We didn't turn our scorecards in. Right. So, so and, and we wouldn't want anything anyway because we're not going to be there tomorrow. Right. But, uh, you know, that was the biggest thing going into that is, is the, the uh, not knowing ex- 100% sure where I was at shooting-wise because, I mean, it's a brand-new setup, uh, you know, getting it dialed in and all that. I felt comfortable, but the bigger thing going into this shoot as I was nervous – because I didn't know the format, didn't know what to expect, didn't didn't know nothing going down here to this and walking in and then seeing all these people get their bows out and they've got the big stabilizers on them and they're <laughs> launching these arrows and you know and they're hit, hitting the targets and you know and I'm like man I, I hope I can you know I hope I can 
make these conversions in my head and you know not that I was doing any math I was like yeah that looks okay that's a 40 meter target that's about 44 yards I think they said so I got a pin gap between my 40 and 50 yard pin right exactly yeah. and we you know what we talked about this the possibility of us setting up our other bows with a uh, kind of a specifically as target hey we got our uh, bows in the vehicle what do you think we stop right here in this field there's two deer oh look I, at the rack on that buck look, dude look, that that has got a rack on it yes it does wow <laughs> uh the joys of driving out here seeing animals i tell you but you know middle of, here it is five o'clock in the afternoon on our way home and the deer are out in the the field feeding on the up, away. feeding on the fresh vegetation that the farmer planted yeah buddy. Betcha he's happy but, but uh, uh so we talked about maybe setting up our other bows as our one pin target bows because yeah, yeah absolutely you know so other than that you know get down here and shooting um once i shot a couple practice rounds even when that i lost that one underneath the bale when it zipped low I, you know that, that was a 66 yard shot and and I, I didn't even have a pin set up for that i was just guessing so well now we now we know too worried but oh after that once we got on the course i was okay till we walked to the first target and i looked down range and it was 50 <laughs> meters <laughs> through trees and downhill and i'm like oh my gosh right you know and i'm glad we had 10 or 15 minutes before the shotgun starts so we could actually sit there and contemplate what we had to do and i'm i'm running through my mind about how far i think it is and i'm like okay we well we knew by the size of the target the face of the target being 80 centimeters that it was going to be between 35 and 50 meters i think yep if i remember right so i'm like okay 50 meters 55 yards at the most I'm going to take my, and I know I know it wasn't 35. It was just, it was a long poke. I said, I'm going to take my 50-yard pin, and I'm going to, I'm going to hold it over top of the bull, you know, about halfway up, up the, uh, the face of the target. And that's how I judged the first, the, my very first shot. And it actually got pretty doggone close, and then I just dialed in after that. Right, exactly. And you know what? Matter of fact, this was something that, as you're talking, I was thinking about that shot, because... When we came back to that, for the second round, we started back at, at, at target number 10 again. For the yeah. second round, we all started in the same place again. But other people, and you got to remember that some people were using uh, recurves. Right. And there were some young archers there that um, I don't know where they were shooting from exactly. But when we got back to number 10 for the second time, they had, they had their binoculars out and they were looking into the tree. Yeah, there was an arrow stuck in a tree about 20 feet up. Right, because they were like, yeah, well, they said they launched the arrow and it went into that limb. Yeah. And and sure enough. It was there. It was there. But I was just thinking about that, how much of an arc that they maybe had to shoot. Yeah, well, I do know they were letting the kids shoot from different different pens, and I believe even the women were shooting from different pens, or maybe it was recurves. I can't remember. Uh, Because if you notice the people in front of us, they didn't shoot at the far stake like we did. You know, in front of us. Right, exactly. And in matter of fact, I think the one lady even said that uh, she was a a cub or something or whatever it was. And um, so it was just one of those things that, you know, we got out there, we had some fun. And uh, what did you take away also? uh, You know, uh, the nerves, finally getting the first round under your belt, took a little bit of a break. And, and then heading out to the second. What were you thinking around going about going into the second round? Round two, I was I was knowing that we were shooting the same targets again. I was like, okay, what are the long distances? What what did I shoot for the long distance? What pin was I using? Was I splitting pins, you know, or was I doing a holdover, you know, and trying to remember what it was that, that where I made the the better of the three shots? You know, because you're allowed three shots at the target, or not not allowed. You you take three shots. You in this in this. Fida, you, you you shoot three arrows, and this is something Dan alluded to, uh, a difference between uh, this uh, paper tournament, you're shooting targets, as opposed to a 3D where you shoot just one. Yeah. You know, you get uh, three shots, so you actually get uh, your first shot, and then you can either stick with where you were at and be good, or you could take the chance and improve. Yeah, or try to figure out, okay, I made a bad shot. What what? Did I make a bad? How how did I make that shot? What caused me to miss and try to correct it and and then you know, take your second and third shot 
whereas in a 3D ter- uh, tournament world, you get one shot at the foam and that's it. And, yep. And you move on. You don't know, you know, how you, if you missed, what caused you. You don't have time to really work all that out and take another shot. Right. Exactly. So he was he was explaining that, and so yep. Um, you know, I know I know that afternoon round. It started off a little bit warmer than it did in the morning. Yeah, it was warm. Uh, I wanted to take a nap, but you know, I I started off like gangbusters. Uh, the first three targets, and I was up seven points on my score from the first round. I'm like, okay, I'm already up seven. You know, this this round's going to go good. You know, I might I shot a 170 the first round out of a possible 216 points. Um, I had I only had a one score that where I only scored one point. Didn't have any misses. Um, I had a few threes here and there, but the rest were fours, fives, and sixes. And those first three targets, I, I was like, okay. I, you know, I started feeling good about myself. I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm going to make a little run here. And then uh, the next five targets. <laughs> the wheels came <laughs> off. Well, put it this way. Um, I had three I had three targets left at the end, so that would have been three and three, six. The six targets in the middle, I lost 11 points. Right. You, you were know, hurting. Yeah, I wound up losing the five that I had that I was up, and then I was down seven with three targets left. And then actually, I uh, the last three targets I jammed and actually wound up two ahead of where I finished the first round. Shot a 172 the second round. So out of a 436 possible or a four 432 possible, I shot uh, a 342. So you know, and that was that was awesome. Okay. You didn't lose any arrows on the course, unlike Dan, who lost a lost a, a tip. Well, it wasn't due to the fact of a bad shot. No, it wasn't. It was actually because he did a good shot. It was the backstop of the target that yeah, was they, not good. They put the bullseye right over top of a post. Um, yeah. So if the if the arrow went through, it ran in, went right into a, a wood two by four. Well, second round, you noticed a lot of those targets. The foam was getting blown out on the bullseyes, and. Uh, yeah, he had he had a lot of pass throughs. He had some issues because uh, he was shooting those smaller diameter arrows. Man, those things were zipping. Yeah, and those things are expensive. I mean, I, I don't know how many arrows did he did he ruin more than just the one? Actually, he, he uh, lost the insert on one, and by me, no means we talked we talked to him about these arrows, and they're not cheap. And uh, he had one uh, he had two others. One he didn't think it was bent. But he's gonna have to check it out, and and then it's fantastic. and then the third one, uh, he had to push it back through the foam, and uh, it didn't look like the fletching, fletching was harmed. But he'll uh, have to go and do a little surgery on it if he need be. So uh, you look at look at both rounds, I guess. Um, my takeaway is, I, I think I'm I'm solid where I'm shooting right now with my, my setup, my sights on that bow. Um, what I want to do now is I want I want to step back and, and start getting solid at 50 and 60 yards. And who knows, maybe even maybe even longer. Um, you know, obviously we're, we, we were shooting at a target that, the, I mean, an 80 centimeter face target. Um, you know, it's a pretty big target. Yeah, it was, it was pretty big. But then sometimes they kind of tricked you. And uh, that was kind of the fun of this tournament was that they would take the two di- two biggest diameters and maybe switch them and, and do a little trickery with uh, how the woods was set up uh, and the, give you a lighting, tunnel yeah. lighting tunnel effect, uh, putting a, a bigger target on a smaller bale or vice versa. And it, it kind of played with your mind a little bit. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the things Dan had to run through his mind when he was shooting. Well... I, um, I I think I'm gonna I'm just like I said I'm just gonna work on on my distance now and just trying to get solid at, at, at shooting. Uh, I played around with a release afterwards that that Dan had in his toolbox. And you said me, that was a nice release. Yeah, it was a, a Carter release that I, I'm you know I'm looking at a different release. And we talked about the reasons why and, and some of the things that I was working through. And I think that's gonna clean up a lot of the the little little bits of sloppiness in my shooting but uh you know as far as as my hunting setup i'd be confident to walk out right now with it 20 30 yards and and go after something i'm i'm not worried about that at all right but, but like you said uh 
I think now, I, and I'm debating, do, do I take the DNA or do I take the, the decree that I've got setting back and build a target bow just to shoot targets? So, I think so. You know, I had a blast. Um, I, I can see... I can see why people play this game now, and that's really what it's a game. Uh, you, you know, you, you want to maximize your score, and it's, it's. I don't know, I guess looking at it, I don't golf, but I can kind of equate it to that, I guess. You know, you, you try to shoot the, the lowest score possible with golf. Here you're trying to maximize your points. You, yep. And, and fine tune and, and hit a point at different distances, different situations. Yeah. So different angles different yeah. lengths different yeah. we had a couple we had this one it was about uh, 20 feet in the air with and we got a picture of this i, I don't know if yeah. you posted this picture yeah. um and it was about a uh, dan said it was about 38 degree incline yeah we were shooting down on it yeah straight down on this target that was uh it was on on a, a bale so the bale is facing straight ahead when you look down on that, it was only about, what, 15, 17 yards away, maybe? Maybe. You know, it, it was within the 15-meter range, which would have put it, you know, or was it 10 meters was the shortest? I think it was, I want to say that was, uh, oh, yeah, I think it was 10 meters is the shortest. So it was somewhere between 10 and uh, 25 meters. But anyway, that thing was, when you, when you think about how you're shooting at a target, it looked like an, an egg. <laughs> because the, when you're on the incline, the face starts to disappear the steeper the incline. Yep. So that was a tough target. It, mm -hmm. That wasn't easy. Actually, that was that one. Uh, I think I wound up shooting uh, four four three on the last round. The first round I shot a five four four on it. So it uh, that that one. Yeah, the the angle definitely played with with my head a little bit and that was a couple other shots too that uh they had the target kind of on an angle mm -hmm. that you couldn't see the face square right so yeah. that was that was fun so no overall man i'm i'm happy with the way i shot i'm glad we went down oh well, absolutely I was, I was apprehensive but once we got shooting um you know the first two thirds of the first round i was fine and then uh, that last third i kind of kind of struggled a little bit um, and then after lunch, you know, the first three, I did good. And the last three, I did good. Yeah, but that middle. Well, you know what? I got, I don't, I got, I got a little swagger in me and I'm like feeling a little confident and I didn't take time and sit and really think about what I was doing. Oh, you getting the scorecards out? Yeah, I got the scorecards <laughs> right here. But so, yeah, it was, it was that middle three that, uh, you, you took a beating on. Yeah, there was a couple of targets there that it was like four, 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 or four, four, three, and it's just. A... But you do got a lottery number to play tonight. Yeah, six five four. Six five four. Yeah, I hit six five four on quite a few of them. That yeah, was you my did. Shot, so that was that was fun. So, no, it was uh, it was it was fun. Had a blast. So. Well, I tell you what, why don't we uh, we we take a quick break here as we're driving down the road. Yeah, we're, we're gonna... coming up to Ann Arbor here, and uh, we come back. We'll talk a little bit and wrap up the show. So we'll step outside. We'll be right back after this. PSE Archery has always dominated the speed category. Now, the most revolutionary cam system ever to hit the market has perfected the shooting experience. Introducing PSE's Evolve Cam System, featuring extremely high let-off capabilities and the smoothest draw cycle in history. No other cam system has ever delivered this level of total comfort and total control. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Killer Food Plots have been helping property owners for over 20 years create premier whitetail habitat. Whether replenishing your soil with their all-natural organic fusion pellets or planting a premier KFP food plot seed blend to help your deer rebuild their bodies through spring and summer while supplying the much-needed high energy during and after the rut, you can trust that Killer Food Plots family and their products will help your deer achieve their full potential. Welcome back, everybody. Last segment of the show. We are rolling up here just about Ann Arbor here. Uh, 
heading north in Michigan on US 23. Another glorious day, a lot of fun. I'm tired, wore out, but uh, I had a lot of fun today. So, yeah, we did. You're looking for deer, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> Though I'm not gonna lie, I'm uh, looking for deer. Uh, we just saw them two. Was that two bucks? Back that there? was two bucks. That uh, that one buck was uh, pretty nice. Uh, they were out above its head, over its ears. We were coming back two weeks ago from taking Jacob back down to school um, when he was off, and he and I haven't I haven't talked about this because I. I don't think we, we didn't have an opportunity on last week's show, but uh, as we're coming north up 75 through uh, northern Ohio, I can't tell you how many bucks I saw in velvet that were just already had monster racks on. You, you tell that they were going to be nice, mature bucks, you know, this year, pushing probably that 130, 140 class, maybe, maybe 150. Um, body structure on these deer were huge. And I'm just going crazy. I'm driving, and my this wife, Shannon, she's like, would you just pay attention yeah. to the road? And I'm like, no, I'm look, look at the size of that deer, you know? And it was like five or six of them that we've seen. Really? You know, just one after the other, after the other, after the other. You know what? Uh, one thing Ohio is becoming really, you know, yeah, really good big for. Deer. Big deer. Uh, we've talked to Mark Hammer and the Hammer Buck. Uh, definitely, uh, I've seen pictures on Facebook now. Mark Hammer's gearing up for the season, and... He, hey, he, 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 speaking of Mark, give him a quick shot. Did you see he's he's up to have his deer put on the cover of a magazine? And I can't remember the name of it right I offhand. I did that. I did see that. We've got that posted on our Up North Journal page. So make sure you go over and check that out. Right, absolutely. Go give Mark a, a little helping hand. Uh, vote for him to get on the, 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 the cover of the magazine. And uh, I just seen, I think it was yesterday or maybe the day before, he just finished him and his son building a, a hopper. Grain, a grain feeder, yeah. Yep. Gravity grain feeder. 600 pound hopper yeah he said now i gotta figure out how to get on the back of a trailer yeah <laughs> he, he he thought the the 175 pound one refilling was once a week he won't have to do it as much with a 600 pound no but he's gonna have to get that thing in the woods that's the next key right exactly so but you know what it, it's nice to have big deer uh in ohio they're, they're, they're doing a really good job uh, unlike um well michigan's got some good deer yeah, well, we got some bad news this week, and I know that's where you're headed right now. So, Right, exactly. You know, uh, July 13th, uh, if you've been watching Facebook and listening, uh, the NRC Commission, uh, Lincoln Roan and his group, uh, Michigan Let Them Go, Let Them Grow, were uh, on the leading forefront of uh, trying to get uh, a statewide APRs put into place for the state of Michigan. Kind of help Michigan out uh, yep. trying to tr- trying to get the age structure of the bucks and the, the, the better class bucks uh, up Following there. Following right along with QDM and what they, they do. Right. Taking a little bit of, taking a page out of QDM and A. Uh, we got the Northwest 12 up there in, in the northwest part of the upper state of Michigan that, that is doing this. So doing we, very well. So we got a role model for um, what can be done and what the outcome will be yeah and we've we've been to the summit uh we've seen the presentations on it uh what your bucks can end up being the healthy of the the health of your herd will turn out to be and this all leads to also an economic impact for everybody up there yeah it's it's a win-win-win situation it, it's an it's an all-win situation uh when you've got better bucks in the area that more people want to go hunting in your era area uh first of all the price of land value is going to go up yeah you get more people coming in you're gonna have tourists coming into the area spending money wanting to hunt these bigger bucks if if we had them here and this goes for for state land as well state land as well yeah and then people want to buy land in the, in the area where bigger bucks are exactly so they can hunt them which drives up the the price of, of land. You're like, well, wait a minute. I, you know, I don't want the price. Well, if you own land in the area, you want your land to be valuable. Yeah, you don't want it to be non-valuable, non-value yeah. added. And so that that that's an indicator that this process APRs do work. It also helps out the mom and pop shops. Yeah. You know the the little gas stations that these hunters need to stop at to pick up some little bit of groceries. Uh, Maybe buy a license and stuff. Yeah, yeah, get their supplies, what have you. Right. Buy gas, but, uh, you know, rent cabins, rent ATVs, whatever, you know. And then when they're up in the area and they see how beautiful Michigan is, they're going to maybe come back for the summer and spend more money here um, or buy a place here. And then, you know, when people are buying property and property values are increasing, 
uh, that, that increases our tax base. So these local communities that are struggling to just get by all of a sudden have an infusion of, of tax dollars from property tax values going up uh, in, in helping the school systems. It's just a win-win-win situation all the way around. Exactly. But so that was all uh, Lincoln Roan and his group leading, using that as an example of what can Michigan do and be. And uh, the vote, the vote came out on Thursday that we're not going to do anything. Yeah, the status quo. The NRC actually turned their nose up at it and uh, said no. Um, you know, and we were live streaming earlier today, Danny, and we kept saying there was five on the board. Uh, and uh, Tony Smith actually corrected it means there's seven people on that board. The problem was that they didn't need the, the seven votes. That once it got to four, it was done. So there you go. Um, it didn't matter after that. But uh, yeah, they just basically turn it down. And we're gonna. It's gonna be status quo here in Michigan as you, business as usual. Uh, they want CWD cleaned up. They want the TB cleaned up. But we haven't been able to curtail this these issues over the last several years. And what's the answer to taking care of it? Doing the same thing over again. Just and doing the same thing over. And it, it's like a broken record. It is. You know. And I, I forget the old saying, but doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Uh, is, is just it's insanity and that's that's kind of what we're up against right now and you know and I know certain people say you know well, we don't need APRs pushed uh, and mandated we can do this ourselves and we can and you know and maybe maybe now this the line's been drawn in the sand uh, here in Michigan to where uh, if the hunters if, if, if they truly are fed up maybe what we need to do is, is get with so, uh, like-minded people here and, and maybe get a, a political action group together and uh, when we vote for our next governor, because these, these NRC people are appointed, and maybe that's what we need to back somebody who's going to truly use the scientific research and, and data that we've got to, to in, improve our deer health and deer herd. Yep, exactly. And that's one of the things, um, now that this vote has come down and, and what's going to happen, and, and, and basically uh, we're going to try to get Lincoln Roan on, on, we're going to let him calm down a little bit. Yeah, we better give him a week or so. Yeah, and we're going to try to get him on the show and find out what the next steps are. And, you know, it's going to be one of those things. We're going to have to put our heads together collectively and go after the right groups to help the other, us groups, uh, the Michigan, the Lincoln Roan group, uh, uh, maybe getting with MUCC and, and, and finding out, hey. What do you may Get them all involved. Yep, we need some help. Um, what can we do to go after the right people to get um, – the people in place to make the right decisions according to sound science. Absolutely, because right now it's just it, it, there, there's just no direction, um, you know. And, and I'm not advocating that this is going to cure everything. You no, know? It's, it, not. it's just it's but one tool to, to start the process. And like I said, there's been research behind this that, that this is working in other areas. And but but to do absolutely nothing and expect different results, it, it, it is it's insanity. And that's that's where we're at. There's, there's no new ideas being presented by the NRC. There's no uh, new direction. There's there's nothing. I mean, it's, hey, buy more doe tags. Let's, let's shoot up the deer herd. Let's get rid of the, the, the numbers of the deer. It's, it's, there's nothing to do with age structure here. And it's it's just, to me, it's just a waste of time, you know, a waste of our resources. We got, we got this disease in the area. Let's get some sharpshooters out, and we're just going to decimate everything well that that that's one thing and then we've got down here in ann arbor which we're just kind of rolling through now where they've used uh what am i trying to say here oh the um they basically went and they sterilized, sterilized the, the, the they does. tried to sterilize the does they spent two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to to do this project for population control for population control when you could take and sell special limited tags to archers in the area to come in and, and take and harvest these deer. And you know what? And maybe you don't get to keep them. Maybe you just get the opportunity to come in and help out the DNR, and it goes to a food bank. How about that? That way you make a little money on it, plus the fact you get to turn around and help out some people in, in need. Absolutely. And, and there's one thing that hunters are good about is uh, the hunter the hunter for... Hunters for the hungry. Uh, thank you. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> Been a long day. Yeah, you know... and. They have no problems donating a, a deer. Absolutely. They they have no qualms about, you know, this deer's mine, mine, mine. No. Hey, I shot this deer. It, I've already got one. 
or, or maybe, the, you know, like you said, this might be a special tag. Yep, I got it, but you know what? It's going to go to a family in need. Yep, there you go. You know, hey, how's that feel? There's ways of doing things the right way to, to make an impact and keeping things under control. And uh, it just, once again, it, it, it just boils down to these mindless bureaucracies of trying things or doing things and taking it out of the hands of the people who truly care. Yep. And, and what I don't want to happen, and I've, I've kind of seen it a little bit on Facebook, it's only been a couple days since this, this ruling came down. Uh, it's not the DNR. No, there's a lot of been, uh, people speaking out against the DNR. Uh, the DNR, they're the, the boots on the ground. They're the ones that, that implement the rules, but the rules are made by the NRC. It's not the DNR making the rules. The DNR actually asked for APRs up in... DMU 487, which is up in northeastern Michigan, where I hunt, where the and, TV is. And that was one of the hopes. If we did not get a full state APR ruling, a hope was at least maybe we could get that instituted. Moving so forward. Moving forward. Just one little baby step forward, you know, maybe we get the upper half of Michigan into an APR, but that didn't happen either. You know, and there's a lot of things that were said on the back side of this that pe people were at the meeting heard the, the people on, on the commission say... Um, that were just was just appalling. It didn't have anything to do with with the cares of the hunters. Um, it's it just it was some ludicrous things that were being said. And if you want to search some of that out, definitely get on the internet and check it out. Like I said, I'm not earlier on our live stream. I'm not going to sit here and and, and and point stuff out of what he no. said. She said stuff. No, but, but you, know. you you can find that for yourself. And it's just to me for a government official who's appointed uh, to do a job and you got the seven people that are making the decisions for for all the hunters and and, and you know, not just the hunters but even the nature lovers here in, in michigan um you know we don't want to see d disease run through our, our deer herd you know and i know people who like seeing deer that that maybe recreational feed them down here in the lower part of the state where it's legal you know they just like seeing the deer well you know these diseases if they're not kept in check they're going to come through and it's going to get serious yep exactly so you know what it's time to we, we uh, lick our wounds, or and then uh, maybe formulate a, a different game plan. Yeah, you know, and we'll get Lincoln on and, and maybe talk about this a little more. Yeah, and see where and, he's going to go with this. You know, and do a live stream. We'll get him on. You guys can, uh, you know, throw some questions out and stuff. That, it, you know, that way as well. Um, and obviously, it's kind of hard to do a live stream. Uh, well, we we did a live stream today driving down the road, but it's hard to do a podcast while I'm driving, and do a live stream together. So uh, you know, next week we we'll kind of be back to business as usual here hopefully but uh, right we did a, a early morning live stream uh but uh yeah we'll be back business as usual next week you uh you got anything going on here this next week oh uh, you, you know what this about? next week uh quickly run through my my head here as to what dates it is but uh uh next week i think i'm going to take a little uh a little vacation get a, go head to the upper uh, uh to mackinac okay and uh hopefully uh i'll you know what? I think I'm going to try to get a hold of... Uh, we wanted to get Nick Percy on. Yeah, uh, we got to line him up. Yeah, we'll see if we can get Nick Percy on. Talk, start. Ladies and gentlemen, it's July. It's time yeah. to start thinking fall. Get food those plots. food plots, right? Absolutely. So we're going to talk to Nick Percy about it at, over at Killer Food Plots. Get him on what we need to do. Like, uh, we, I think we shared the post on our Facebook page. You know, if you want, get in there. Uh, get that uh, weed killer. Uh, kill off that food plot. Get it ready. You're going to turn it under and get ready for a fall plot. Yeah, actually, I'm going just a little bit of a different route, but uh, very, you know, a lot of the same steps. But uh, we're going to get out there and fertilize again here in the end of August, probably like probably Labor Day weekend when I get up there, and we're going to spread down our our uh, carnage brassicas from Killer Food Plots, throw down our fertilizer, and then we're going to take and we're going to mow that field that I've got right now on top of it so we've got that thatch to cover it and uh and, and get that stuff on the ground and let it roll you know there you go so you know but uh yeah this next week uh we're gonna see about getting a couple people on the show so uh we'll let you know if we, we get them lined up we'll, we'll get uh something out there a little bit early so you can uh, formulate your questions find out what's going on absolutely um i want to i want to see if i can get uh, my forester on as well and uh, kind of talk to him uh anybody looking looking into to, to land and wanting to forest it and we can yeah, talk to brock and get into the forestry program and uh you know save your money save yourself some money on your taxes right absolutely absolutely that's all part of it um 
But other than that, nope. Uh, it's middle of July, and we just got done shooting a tournament. Yeah, yeah. I, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm getting. I think I'm going to shoot tomorrow. I'm going to get the bow out again tomorrow and do some more shooting. Don't have. A, I do have to work tomorrow, but uh, tomorrow morning I think I might get up and fling some more arrows. And you know, next week is going to be the last week that I really don't have anything to do until Labor Day. Uh, after that, I'm stacked up with uh, events at Cabela's. The several Cabela's we got around the area and. Uh, We've got the grand opening coming in in a couple of weeks. We're going to be down there with them at the new store. We got Bow Fest coming up. And we, uh, we got August uh, 5th and 6th. We're going to have uh, Mike and I will be at the Chesterfield store at Cabela's, the new one. Uh, August 26th is Bow Fest. Yep. And so it's going to be uh, starting to it's wind good. up here. Oh, matter of fact, I think at the end of the month, in two weeks, uh, we're going to have Bow Hunting Classic. Actually, I will be at Cabela's in Dundee for that, uh, working for Vortex Optics. Right. So, so, yep, it's, ladies and gentlemen, it's it, back. It's time. It's time to get ready for hunting season. It is. Well, we're still trucking up north here. We're going to let you go. You can probably hear it in our voices here. We're on a rough road <laughs> running through a little bit of a construction zone. So uh, we're going to let you go, and we'll be back again next week. We'll hopefully have somebody on to, to talk some food plots or some hunting or maybe even get Lincoln on, but we'll, uh, we'll have somebody on. Hopefully we'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys next week. Y'all take care. This episode was brought to you by PSC Archery, Black Eagle Arrows, Killer Food Plots, Cabela's, Spot Shooters, Antler Action, Family Traditions Tree Stands, Tom's Custom Turkey Calls, and Badass Slingshots. Thanks for listening and join us again here next week. Until then, remember, as we always like to say, if you're out on the water or in the woods, shoot straight and be safe until next week on the Up North Journal.